Minerva presents Warm Greetings, Fellow Book Devourers. Get ready to feast your mind on an irresistible tale that will leave you hungry for more notes from the underground by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Your feedback fuels my creativity and motivates me to keep creating great content. If you're enjoying my videos, please take a moment to show your support by liking this video and subscribing following my channel. And hey, let's have a chat in the comments section. Part I. Chapters I and I.I. I. The book begins with a note from Dostoevsky himself saying that the notes and the writer are fictional. He does, however, say that the person writing the notes must exist in the society of his day simply because of the circumstances of society itself. He then says that the person is of the recent past and that the text of this book is an attempt to bring out the reasons for his actions and to make it clear why he was bound to appear in our midst. From this point, the author or writer of this text is that fictional character claimed by Dostoevsky. The author begins with the statement that he's sick, spiteful, and unattractive, and that his liver hurts. He says it might be something other than his liver, but he refuses to see a doctor out of spite, though he's not certain who is being injured by that show of spite. The author was once in the civil service and says that he was mean simply because he was honest. Because he couldn't take a bribe, he allowed himself to be mean. On the occasion when someone showed a kindness, see, with a bit of sugar, he'd calm down and later be angry with himself for it. After weaving this entire tale of meanness, the author says that he lied out of sheer spite. The author admits that he had no real power, that he was merely frightening sparrows to no purpose. He'd gnash his teeth and go on a tirade to a particular petitioner, but in the end, he had no real authority. In fact, the author says that he simply didn't have what it takes to become malicious. He says that he couldn't become mean or a hero or even lazy because a culture, learned man of the 19th century, is characterless. He holds the opinion that a man of strong character is limited. He then points out that he's not writing to amuse, but will now move to the one topic everyone loves to talk about, self. The author writes that his life could be easier if he lived as the men of action. He says then that some may think that he's just bragging, but that no one would brag on their own diseases or shortcomings. This writer notes that he often commits vile deeds, and that as he's trudging back to his own squalid apartment, he goes over those deeds in his mind. His question to his fellow man is whether others feel the same sense of pleasure over those vile deeds that he feels. The point according to the author, is that you will not change yourself because you just can't do anything about it. The author notes that it's probably not clear at this point, but that he's going to explain it all in good time. The writer is absolutely not laying the blame off on anyone else. He says that he'll realize that he's in deep despair and then, if someone should slap him for his vile deed, he'll know full well that he is at fault for all of it. But he says that he is at fault through no fault of your own, because he is smarter than those around him, embarrassingly so. He says that it still wrinkles, even though the laws of nature are governing all the movements and actions. Part I. Chapters I, 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 I. Now comes one of the points regarding a man of action as previously discussed. This man of action, confronted with a wall, will sincerely give up his charge as a lost cause. There is, after all, a wall as a deterrent. This man, according to the author, is a normal man and the writer envies the normal man. The man will even believe himself to be a mouse, though an acutely conscious mouse. This mouse will have a different opinion of justice than others because of his heightened sensibility. Confronted with men who laugh at the little mouse, 
he'll slip back into his hole with a shrug of contempt for those others. This, according to the author, is a feigned contempt because he won't really believe it and will live its life wallowing in malice. The author then goes into a discussion about the laws of nature. He points out that 2 plus 2 makes 4 and that's a fact. A law of mathematics. Just as it's impossible to deny that, it's impossible to deny that, it's impossible to deny the laws of nature. It's also inconceivable that nature would consult a person to determine if the laws are acceptable. The author says that the person who came to a wall and accepted that it is an indestructible obstacle has no choice but to do so just as a person who determines to find a way around has no choice but to seek out that alternative. He says that there is no doubt that the wall exists but that some people will blame themselves for the wall's very existence even if that's obviously an incorrect conclusion. The situation leads to pain, and the author will soon undelve into that as a new subject. He says that some people may wonder that he'll find pleasure in anything, even a toothache, and that he does so. He says that the person with a toothache moans and obviously finds pleasure in moaning because the moaning serves no other purpose. In the case of a toothache, the only relief lies in the hands of the Wagenheims, dentists who advertise their services in Russia. As the author puts it, if that person wishes the toothache to stop, it will. He urges that everyone listen to the moans of an educated man and to note that the moans change after a couple of days. His moans irritate his family and serve no other purpose, but he continues to moan with trills and flourishes. His family knows that he could moan without all the extra, but he continues out of spite. The author then says that some readers by now may be feeling the same of his own writing, but that he will continue also out of spite. The author says he's relieved that the reader can see through him. He then questions whether any intelligent man can have self-respect. Part I, chapters V, V, and V. The writer says that there are some cases that can't be blamed on the laws of nature. In fact, he would get himself into trouble as a child when he hadn't done anything wrong, seemingly for the opportunity to say that it wouldn't happen again. He says that penitence would be a lie and that in itself was loathsome. He says the reader may ask why he would do such a thing and answers that it was better than sitting with folded arms. He says that he made up a life for himself and sometimes pretended offense at something that didn't happen. By the time he was done, he'd have convinced even himself of the offense. He did this so often that he no longer has any control over himself. He says he even tried this with regard to love and did fall in love twice in this way. The dull, unlearned man takes an immediate cause and convinces himself that there's a reason for whatever his current activity may be. The author says that's the difference between him and an unlearned man. For example, a man who believes he has been wronged will find the primary cause of his action to be the quest for justice. The author, taking the same action in the same circumstance, sees himself acting only out of spite. Therefore, the wrong is no longer at issue, but becomes like the toothaches. Only the toothaches. Only something to complain about, but not something that's the fault of of anyone. He then dwells on the greats of the era, the painters and writers. He says that if he were in a position to do so, he would drink to those who create those beautiful things and in doing so would grow a large belly and a double chin. He says that people would then say, simply because of his belly and chin, that he must be somebody. The writer says that anyone can understand what is and is not in his best interests and that no one would actually do anything that is not in his best interests. 
The author says that it seems no one will willingly go off into the dark to seek his own way when there's an established route available. But the fact is that some will do just that, and for no reason other than that stubbornness pleases them. The fact that the person has the right to do that is a precious right, according to the author. The writer describes a friend. This is a person everyone knows who will eloquently tell everyone the facts of truth and reason, but then will act in the opposite. Another example is that of Cleopatra. She is said to have stuck pins into the breasts of her slave girls just to hear them cry. Man today has learned more than in those barbaric ages, but still doesn't always act within the laws of reason. That ability to do the opposite of what is thought to be right and true is what the author describes as the most advantageous, advantageous advantage available to man. He says that independent wishing is what man wants, regardless of the consequences. Part I, Chapters via. The writer talks of what would happen if there became a formula for all our whims and wishes. He suggests that some people simply stop wishing because there'd be no point in wishing when the outcome is determined by a graph, but will quickly point out the flaw in that reasoning. Then he says that most of us make wishes based on what we think would be advantageous to us, but later find that wasn't the case. He says that most people, given the option to wish or to reason, with choose reason, then he begins to argue the other side. He says that if that were the case, he could predict his life for the next 30 years and that everything he does would have been destined to happen because of that reason. The entire problem with this line of thought according to the author, is that man simply wants sometimes to be free to do something just because he wants to do it, even if it goes against what would be advantageous to him, and even if he has to wish for it. The author says that life might sometimes be a sorry mess, but that at least it isn't the result of a calculation of a square root. He then says that the gentleman he's addressing will say that a person simply can't wish for something contrary to their own good, but the author disagrees. He insists that some people will wish for something not in their best interests simply for the sake of being able to wish. He says that some men will become vile pernicious, and insensible for the sake of wishing for something that's not in their best interest and that they'll hold to those wishes to the bitter end. For the person who insists that there is free will, but that reason is still in control, the author has a reply. He says that two times two will be four even without my will. Is that what you call free will? The author next argues that you might try to cure a man by using reason, but poses the question how anyone can say that man should be remade. The writer points out that man sometimes needs a change, an outlet. He says that it doesn't matter whether it's ultimately good or ultimately bad in the grand scheme of things. The bottom line is that smashing something is also very pleasant on occasion. However, man needs a creative outlet, and the writer asks what would happen if man didn't have that. He says that is why man constructs a city, causes a war, and tears it down, so that there's something to build again. The author then argues heavily against reason above wishes. He says that if two times two makes four is all there were to live by, an intelligent man would be forced to stop up his five senses and to submerge himself in contemplation. Even that would be a dead end, according to this author. But at least he could, upon occasion, the writer sets up a particular situation in which he's searching for a place to escape the rain. He says that some might say a chicken house and a mansion are exactly the same if the only goal is to escape the rain. He says that's only true if the only purpose is to escape the rain. 
He won't be happy with the chicken coop until someone gives him a better idea, and that will only happen if someone changes his desires. The writer says that there are some things men won't admit to anyone other than a very close friend, and some things a man won't even admit to his friends. Finally, there are some things a man won't even admit to himself. Dostoevsky insists that the more decent a man, the bigger the list of things not to be admitted. To test this theory, the author writes that he plans to see if he can be entirely honest with himself. The possibility that a person can be completely honest might exist, the author says. He's next going to try being completely honest with himself, though he notes that he's not expecting anyone else to read his notes. Part I, I, chapters I, 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 I. The author talks of his own self-consciousness about his appearance. He says that his face carried a nasty, abject expression and that he tried to cover that by assuming an intelligent air. He notes that he could stand the revolting facial features if only people could see through that to the intelligence. Still, he remains so aware of his shortcomings that he finds he cannot meet the eyes of others. There are no decent men who do not act as slaves and cowards, according to the writer. He notes that only asses and their mongrel hangers. On will show courage at all times, and that these people are not even worth consideration. The author talks of a period of isolation. He says that others weren't like him, but perversely, he would occasionally put himself in a position to be friends with everyone in his office. He says that at those times, he put down his isolation to squeamishness that he'd actually derived from books. He's play card games and spend time with those people. Somehow, the writer finds himself in a social setting and encounters an officer. This officer is never fully described, though he's larger than the author. When the writer is standing in an aisle down which the officer is walking, the officer bodily picks up the writer and moves him aside so that he can continue on his way. The writer is offended greatly and begins to imagine that it's an incredible wrong. He works up his courage to engage in a duel, but never makes it happen. He finally borrows money from Anton to buy a new collar for his coat in order to make himself look as presentable as possible and goes for a walk along a particular place where the officer also often walks. For weeks, the writer works on the courage to bump the officer when they meet along this walkway, but he always steps out of the way at the last moment. Then comes the day when he suddenly works up his nerve and the two bump shoulders in passing. The writer is vindicated, though the officer seems not to even notice the contact. He admits that he dreams a lot. In his dreams, he's either the hero or he's mud. In one case, he dreams that he receives countless millions, which he gives away to benefit humanity. But that's not the end of this dream. He also admits to everyone his shortcomings, which are actually not shortcomings at all, but are lofty and beautiful. He would then accept the kisses from many, though they'd all be dolts, and would go off, barefoot and hungry to preach new ideas and rout the reactionaries. In this dream, the Pope moves to Brazil and Lake Como is moved to Brazil and Lake Como is moved to Rome for the celebration. He then says that he's not ashamed of the dream. The author says that he would alternately dream and then go out in an effort to meet friends. He has only a few who are little more than acquaintances, but feels the need for companionship anyway. One of these companions is a former classmate named Simonov. He notes that Simonov is always surprised to see him, though he apparently drops in occasionally. On one particular day, Simonov has company. Two other former classmates named Trudelubov and Furfikin. The three are planning a farewell dinner for another of their classmates, Zverkov. They continue their discussion of the dinner details until the author says that he'll come along 
literally inviting himself. He realizes that he's committing to pay his share and is questioned by Ferfichkin about his ability to pay. Semenov seem embarrassed, and the author already owes Semenov money that he hasn't repaid. The author assures them that he has the money, and they agree to meet at 5 o'clock at the Hotel de Paris. As soon as he's out the door, the writer is berating himself for deciding to go. He has only a little money, and he owes the monthly salary to his servant, Apollon. He recalls his childhood days without fondness. He says that the boys his age, realizing that he read books and was advanced well beyond them intellectually, did not like him. He had no friends and eventually wanted them, even had one but couldn't resist wielding control that drove that friend away. He wants not to go, but finds that he's dreaming of how his life would be if he were to somehow win their friendship and so walks out the door without paying a pollen, hires a coach, and arrives at the hotel just before five o'clock. Part I.I. Chapters I.V. and Vi. The dinner is a disaster for the author. He arrives at five o'clock and waits for more than an hour, only to discover that the time was changed to six o'clock and that Simonov forgot to tell him. Almost immediately, Zerkov asks him a question, and the author perceives derision that might or might not have been there. Zerkov asks about his salary, and the author asks what's the point of the interrogation, but does tell his salary, and then blushes. Both the other former classmates make negative comments about the low salary. Zerkov notes that the author has gotten thin and looks him over. The author is acutely aware of his shabby clothing and his stained trousers. As the night lengthens, the author begins to drink and soon becomes quite drunk. As the others talk and laugh, the author paces back and forth in the room. On the rare occasions he does talk, it's to cut down Zverkov, which isn't well received by any of the others. Soon, even Simonov says that he should not have allowed the writer to attend, and they all put it down at least partly to his drunkenness. When the party breaks up, the four friends are going there, which turns out to be a brothel. The author asks Simonov for enough money to join them, and Simonov almost throws it at him. The author does follow, but when he arrives, the four have all gone into rooms with women. A woman approaches him and they walk off to her room together without speaking a word. The writer wakes in the brothel in the bed of a woman he learns is named Lija. He realizes that they've fornicated, and he likens it to spiders who indulge in an act that should have been the consummation of love, but is not. He asks, and she tells him her name is Lija. He then tells her of watching a coffin taken out of a brothel in a poor side of town and weaves a story of the burial that would likely take place in several inches of water because of the snowy weather. He continues to question her and talks at length about the love that can exist between a father and a daughter. After a point, she says that not all families are like that, and that some fathers would sell their daughters rather than see them marry honorably. The writer, assuming this is what happened, Elijah says that poverty is often the reason for this, but he says that a lack of godliness could also be the culprit. The writer goes on and on about how people can be happy as a family. He says that he had no family of his own. And that's how he wound up as he has. In a family, the wife may be jealous beyond all reason or may harp and nag at a man in order to make up. But the fact remains that a man who watches his wife suckle their child can never turn from that wife, according to the writer. When Lija takes on a mocking tone, the writer is immediately angry though he admits that he should have known that it was her way of getting past her shyness. Part I.I. Chapters V.I. V.I.I. Thinking that she's making fun of his earlier observations, the writer goes on a tirade. He tells her that she's worse, 
that the common laborer who sells his work for a period of time each day because she sold her soul and has no hope of anything better now. He says that she's in the position that she'll never find love. For why should a man love her if he has only to command that she do his bidding anyway? He says that he's heard that women in her position may take lovers but says it means nothing because he's actually robbing her of her normal fee and that no man could truly love her knowing she could be called from his bed to another at any moment. He then launches into a tirade about the fate of women in her position. He tells of one he'd seen thrown out on the steps in freezing weather and of the men who gathered around to make fun of her. He says that woman was probably young and in demand, not that many years earlier. He says that a woman who dies as a prostitute has no loving hand caring for her on her deathbed, but is shoved into a corner and urged to hurry and die. And once dead, there's no one to care about the burial and no one to shed a tear or care for the gravesite. The young woman begins to cry dramatically and the writer hurries to gather his clothes. He gives her his address and walks out, but she follows him and shows him a letter from a medical student. It's a love letter, and the writer notes that it's not feigned, but is an honest declaration of love. Lija says that he gave it to her without knowing what she's doing and that she hadn't yet decided whether she would remain in the brothel. The writer knows that the letter is Lija's one precious possession and that she showed it in order to redeem herself in his eyes. When he wakes in his own home, the writer immediately puts aside all thoughts of Lija, thinking instead of his friends. He writes Simonov a letter of apology in which he lies and says that he'd already had wine while waiting for them and that his being unaccustomed to wine was the reason for his moodiness. He is pleased with the tone of the letter, saying that it reached exactly the right level of apology and aristocratic playfulness. He notes that it would be impossible for a less learned and cultured man to achieve that effect. The writer continues to worry that Lija will come to his apartment and that she'll see that he's a pauper living with a shabby couch and poor clothes. He even worries that Apollon, his servant, will insult her just to be contrary to the writer. When she arrives, he is in a heated argument with Apollon. The writer has just told the servant that he must apologize for his insolence if he wants to be paid. Apollon says he has nothing to apologize for and refuses. When the author realizes Lija is here, he runs to his own room and Apollon enters, saying politely, There's a person out there asking for you. The writer screams at Apollon to leave his room. Part II, Chapters X and X. Lija appears, and the writer invites her to sit, then goes to Apollon. He gives him his wages that are due, then instructs him to go get tea to serve Lija. When the author returns to Liza, he rails against the pollen and tells her of the servant's faults. He then bursts into tears and realizes that he's in a frenzy and must appear ridiculous. Apollon leaves the tea and neither the writer nor Liza are comfortable enough to serve. They sit in silence and the author notes that he's being mean and that it makes Liza sad. He then begins to scream at Lija, asking her why she'd come and telling her that he'd sell the world for a kopeck if it would only gain him a little peace. Lija looks hurt, and the author suddenly realizes that she is in love with him and that she's recognized something only a woman in love could know, that he himself is unhappy. She reaches for him, and they fall into each other's arms, crying. Finally. The author is lying on the couch, his face buried in the cushions, and he realizes that he's going to be terribly embarrassed to look at Lija. He says that when he does look at her, he's immediately caught by an emotion that was both passion and revenge. Lija was afraid for only a second, then they embraced. The author notes that Lija is crying, but all he feels is impatience. 
He says that he knows she's aware that his passion was nothing more than revenge and that it's the final insult to this woman. He says that he didn't hate her. He just wanted her to be gone so that he could be in peace. As she leaves, he considers following her and does yell her name down the stairs before she leaves the building. But he admits that he could never have made her happy and that her leaving was likely for the best. The author writes that the memory, even after the passage of years, is distressing and that it might be a good time to end the notes. He says his story is no uncommon because we all limp, though some to a larger degree than others. He also points out that the person writing this diary might be unacceptable because he's the opposite of a hero. He's an anti-hero. The tone abruptly changes for the final paragraph, with Dostoevsky saying that there is more, but that he believes it's time to simply stop.